Hello, my name is Daniel Tregeagle and I'm an Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist at NC State, where my focus is on the specialty crop economics. I'm going to talk today about several topics in the economics of muscadine vineyards, mainly more about the, the macroeconomic context in which muscadine growers and other specialty crop growers are operating at the moment. Specifically, I'll be talking about the macroeconomic context. I'll be looking briefly at muscadine prices at the Riley Farmers Market to help you uh, think about setting your own pricing uh, by looking at some of the pricing history. And then finishing up by discussing discounting, which is an important concept when valuing long-term investments. And it's intimately related to the interest rate, which is changing rapidly at the moment. This talk is not going to be going into the details of um, muscadine crop budgeting, which we have a talk scheduled on that subject at the end of the year in October. We're currently working on developing that budget and we expect it to be done before the school and we can discuss it at length in that later session. The macroeconomic context that we're operating at the moment is, is quite challenging, as I'm sure you already know. Uh, the forecasts I'll be discussing are generated by the USDA uh, in collaboration with several other federal government agencies. And the real challenge with these forecasts and any forecasts is that they're conditional on a set of assumptions. And as you know, the world changes, uh, those assumptions may long, no longer be relevant. So the report that I'm mainly focusing on here is the USDA agricultural projections out to 20 that's 31, so a 10 year forecast. And those, the report was released in February this year. Most of the calculations were done in sort of November, December, late last year. So unfortunately, they don't take into account the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and the speed up in inflation that we've seen uh, associated with that. However, for long term forecasting, uh, they, they can at least give us a sense of where the economy might be going and what that might mean for consumer demand for fruits and vegetables and muscadines. So the headline figure, of course, is always going to be GDP growth. And we care about that because it correlates with um, overall income and therefore spending power and purchasing power. The forecast from the USDA is that the GDP growth will return to pre-pandemic averages of around about 2% per year in the United States. And that's after rapid growth last year as we recovered from the massive turndown during 2020 and the kind of initial wave of COVID lockdowns. The US dollar is projected to re remain stable. Now that's um, gonna be very important if you are involved in any sort of uh, agricultural trade. Uh, however, it, even if you're growing muscadines for the local market, it still will have some relevance to you as it will affect the, the price of uh, fruits and vegetables at large. So given the, uh, the USDA's assumptions, they're projecting that the, uh, the exchange rate will remain roughly stable over the next decade. Oil prices, however, are projected to increase. So the measure here is the refiner's acquisition cost of imports, which is sort of a weighted average of the price of oil that a refiner has to pay. And it's correlated, of course, to the price of gasoline and diesel, that you, is the, the, which is the measure that you're actually you know, paying. So in this long-term projection, they're expecting the oil price to remain roughly stable for the next few years and then to increase uh, towards the end of the decade. However, of course, in the short term, things change very, very rapidly. And we can see that already the, um, the oil price has increased above what the forecast for this year was. Uh, and a big part of that, of course, is the uh, events in Ukraine, which have reduced the amount of oil on the international market. The American refineries have got a very low inventories. 
So there just really isn't very much oil around, and so its price has been increasing. Depending on how things play out, this could be a, a temporary, um, you know, short term in the, this, the scope of one to two years, and we return to those kind of long term trends as things sort of settle back down again, or not. It's difficult to say, and we'll have to see how the forecasts evolve uh, as more information comes in. But certainly in the short term, you can continue to expect high fuel prices and then high prices of all the other agricultural inputs that are heavily dependent or heavily correlated with the price of oil. Obviously, um, fertilizers and, and pesticides are as well. Uh, interest rates are were forecast to increase steadily over the next decade after you know the last decade and a half of pretty stable interest rates. This graph here is showing uh, the U.S. bank prime rate, which is the the rate that sort of the most uh, the the most loan worthy um, people or institutions can can get, and then you know all of us pay relatively some premium on top of that, but it of course correlates with the bank prime rate. So the forecast was for the prime rate to increase up to about 5% by the end of the decade. Um, of course, in the last <laughs> couple of months, it's increased rapidly due to these in inflationary pressures and these increasing prices up to almost 5% already. Uh, where it will go from here, we'll have to see how re inflation responds to uh, the increase of the interest rates. We may um, see a leveling off in these increases if, if prices start to come down. However, in any case, it's going to uh, have major impacts on the cost of capital if you're taking out any loans. Um, the repayments are going to be, of course, more expensive under a higher interest rate regime. Uh, and it's going to change the, the way that you value um, the, the long-term investment of you know, a, a muscadine orchard, which is a, can, can be sort of a, a multi-year, even multi-decade sort of operation. We'll talk more about that at the end of the talk. So taking these macroeconomic variables, uh, the USDA has a, a set of economic models that forecast the supply and demand for the major agricultural commodities, including fruits and vegetables, which you know, are treated as, as aggregates. So given those forecasts, which as we've seen are already out of date, but given where they were, the forecast for uh, the fruit and nut sector was to increase by 14% over the next decade uh, and vegetables by about 19% over the next decade. A lot of that growth, as, you know, in as much as as much as it is, is being driven by increases in the value of tree nuts largely. So here's that fruit and tree nut uh, value series that we looked at in the previous slide, increasing from about 27 billion dollars overall up to a little bit above 30 billion dollars at the end of the decade. You can see that that's largely being driven by increases at tree nuts, which are growing a forecast to grow at around about 0.8% per annum, whereas non citrus, that's all the rest of the fruits and citrus are only forecast to grow at 0.3% per annum. So on taking that together, we would not expect major changes in the value of US domestic fruit production. Now, that value is going to be some combination of price and quantity, but together they're not forecasting any substantial increases in that overall value. However, the demand for fruits and vegetables and tree nuts continues to grow, and so that demand will be met by increasing imports from elsewhere. So this is the forecast overall agricultural kind of balance of trade the red line being imports, the green line exports, and the black line being the difference between imports and exports. So for the last few years, we've been roughly balanced, but we're 
the USDA is projecting that that difference between imports and exports is going to be increasing uh, over time. And where is that gap coming from? If it's coming from you know, various um, commodity crops, corn and soy, or whatever, that's going to have less impact on fruit growers. However, when we kind of dive into the specifics of these projections, okay, so the export sector, they're not really projecting that any one uh, subsector of the agricultural industry is likely to be driving that slow export growth. Here's horticultural products, which includes fruits and vegetables. But when we look at the import side of things, that import, that import growth is going to be grow, driven almost exclusively by increase in imports of horticultural products and fruits and vegetables, nuts, and some value, value added products made from horticultural products. That's really going to change the composition of the fruits and vegetables in the US domestic market. The share of imports will grow. As we saw previously, the um, overall production of US fruits and vegetables is not forecast to grow substantially. So yeah, the share of domestic production will shrink. This could be an opportunity for American producers who grow um, who grow domestic produce, but especially produce that is sort of exclusively the American, like uh, muscadines. So there's been a lot of research done over the last few decades on consumer willingness to pay for all sorts of product attributes. And there have been two recent meta-analyses looking at uh, consumers' willingness to pay for local products. Uh, one of which was focused on produce specifically that I did with a graduate student earlier this year. And one of them was looking more broadly at uh, produce and meats and all sorts of foodstuffs. And across those two studies, we see that consumers are willing to pay around about a extra third for produce that is labeled as being local compared to produce that is either unlabeled or is from a foreign source. Obviously, your musc muscadines are going to be coming from local areas. And I could foresee, and this is a speculation, a hypothesis, that as the, the share of domestic produce in the overall US economy shrinks, that premium placed on domestic produce may grow over time. So, Again, that's potentially an opportunity for growers of, of local produce, especially if you can be explicit in your marketing to say that this is local, this is grown in the region. So if you're selling your muscadines, within the region, what price might you expect to receive? We've been working on taking the price data from the Raleigh's farmers market over the last decade uh, and aggregating that up into a, a usable data set, because at the moment it's just released day by day in kind of text files. So I'm just going to show you briefly uh, what we've found. So the data is patchy, we only have four years of data at the moment. But what you can see on this graph here, are the recorded maximum prices and minimum prices uh, in the wholesale side of the Raleigh farmers market. So these are for the prices for boxes of muscadines in around the kind of 20 to 25 pound range. And we've converted them here to uh, dollars per pound so they can kind of be compared so you can see that in 2015 and 2016, the prices were fairly stable around about you know, $1.25 or so. They lowered a bit in 2019. Now there's currently no data available for 2018, but for 2019, the prices on average increased up to around about $1.75 on average. Hopefully this can give you a little bit of information about thinking about pricing in, in 2022. Um, 
hopefully we're intending to have the, the full data set analysed by um, the next talk in the, at the end of this year. So we can talk about this time series more thoroughly and uh, with recent prices as well. The last thing I'd like to talk about here uh, is the concept of discounting, which is integral to valuing long-term investments. And it's intimately linked with the interest rate. So since the interest rate has been rising so rapidly, uh, I think it would be useful if you're not already familiar with this concept to just have it in the back of your mind. And you can think about how these changing interest rates are affecting the sort of the value overall of your you know, muscadine investment. The idea of the discount rate is that money in the future is worth less than money now. And the reason for that is that you have more options with money now than you do with money in the future. So I'll explain this example here. At a 2% interest rate, $100 10 years from now is worth only $82 today. So that is to say that if you were given $82 today and you could invest it in the bank, say, or in some investment at a 2% annual interest rate, then 10 years from now you would have $100. So if someone said to you, would you like $100 10 years from now or $82 today? And then at this 2% interest rate, discount rate, you'd be sort of, they'd be equally as good as each other. But if someone offered you $100 now, and then you could invest that at that 2% interest rate, then 10 years from now, you'd have a lot more than $100. So um, that's the kind of the core, the core concept here. And obviously you can see how it would apply to a, perennial crop like a muscadine where you've got um, investments that you have to do right at the start, you know, planting, trellis construction, land clearing and such. And then your income is going to be coming in as a stream over time as you get the harvests uh, at once the, the vines are mature. So let's kind of take a example. Um, this isn't about muscadines in, in particular. Uh, as I said, we're uh, updating the muscadine budget, and once we have, we'll be able to do this analysis for muscadines specifically. But let's just say that we've got some, some crop where we have an annual net return that follows this light blue line here. So in the, the pre-plant year, you have to you know, pay about $8,000 of land prep, in that first year, the payments are even higher because you know, you've got to pay, buy all the plants and install the trellises and such. In the second year, you're still uh, incurring costs greater than revenue, but then by year three onwards, let's assume that you're getting uh, a net return in each year of around about seven or eight thousand dollars. So this thick blue line then is the cumulative returns to uh, the your operation over time. So you can see that in those first three years, they're decreasing, you're kind of further and further in the hole, and then you start getting positive returns, you're making your way out, and then in year, between year seven and eight, you break even, and by year 10, the overall value of this investment has, has turned positive, and the overall value of this would be about $15,000. And this is at an interest rate or a discount rate of 0%. So that is saying that money in the future is worth the same as money today. But once we start to bring in discounting, we'll see how this, this picture here changes. So in the next slide, let's say that we've got that 2% discount rate that we looked at in the first graph. So in that case, the returns that you would get 10 years from now are worth relatively less then the costs you have to incur right now. So it basically bends down the cumulative return curve in those later years. So in year 10, this, this level here is, you'd call that the net present value. So with a zero discount rate, the net present value is about $15,000. But as the discount rate increases, our net present value shrinks because the weight on future years is, is lower than it is under a lower discount rate. 
And we can keep increasing then the discount rate until we find a discount rate that sets the net present value to zero. And that's what is called the internal rate of return of the investment. It's in a sense analogous to saying, instead of doing this um, orchard operation, I could invest money in the bank and get a 7.4% return. There's some caveats to that, but that's broadly the idea here. So the return, annual return on investment of this particular operation here is 7.4%. The reason for talking about this is you can, interest rates are rapidly increasing right now. So we're more in a world, we've, we've moved in the last few months from a world where the interest rate was about three or so percent, three and a quarter, uh, up to 4.75%. And it, it may well go higher because inflation is, is still, it, it's, there's still a lot of inflation. So if you're considering a new investment right now, the value of that investment is lower than it was a few months ago. Uh, and also the uncertainty around that investment has increased because we don't know what's going to be happening with interest rates over time. So I'd like you to just have this concept in the back of your mind as you're thinking about, if, if you're thinking about expanding um, part of your operation or something like that, or putting in a new perennial crop operation that the value of that operation to you from a just purely from a sort of return on asset perspective is lower now than it was a few months ago with lower interest rates. So that was a, a kind of a grab bag of, of big picture and then some small picture topics in economics of um, muscadine growing and orchard growing more generally. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this talk, uh, I'd be very glad to take your questions by email. Uh, here's my email address. Um, and as I said, at the towards the end of this year, we will be having an additional talk on this economics of muscadine orchards, very specifically from sort of a budgeting perspective, looking at all the different costs that go into setting up and running a muscadine operation. Until then, I hope you have a productive season. Thank you.